So hi everyone, my name's Rohan Sant. I'm a recently graduated doctor who will be starting work in the east of England. And my name is Daniel Olaya and I'm a doctor based in London. On behalf of Daniel and I, we'd like to say that we are very honoured to accept the first place award in the Aerotube competition by the Royal Aeronautical Society this year. Now, we decided to produce this project because we're interested in aerospace medicine. And on seeing this competition, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to share this with other people who have an interest in aviation, but perhaps aren't aware of the medical issues affecting long-term space flight. So without any further ado, here is our entry, and we hope that you learned something. Hey guys, my name is Rohan San. And I'm Daniel Olaya. So we're two friends who have recently become really interested in the field of aerospace medicine and are currently in the process of exploring this a little bit further. Now we were doing what I'm sure most people were doing on Saturday the 30th of May and we were watching SpaceX successfully launch humans from Cape Canaveral and land a rocket in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and we were inspired. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, bottom. Now, we're at an incredibly exciting stage of human spaceflight. We have Boeing and SpaceX working to fly human crews from US soil. Plans in place to launch the first pieces of the Lunar Gateway by 2023. And of course, the constant updates of Starship. This is Elon Musk's rocket to get the human race to Mars, which he's hoping to do by 2024, according to a recent CNBC report. However, despite all of the technological advances that we are making, we still have one issue with a key component of what we're sending up there, and that's the humans. And that's what we want to talk about in this video. But first of all, disclaimer, while we both have medical degrees and are very much interested in this field, we're not experts by any means. We just want to bring you some overarching concepts that the layperson may not know about, which we find really interesting. So as we said, humans. Unsurprisingly, the human body isn't designed to work in space. In fact, it really doesn't like it at all. There's the issue of radiation, lack of oxygen and pressure, but also the lack of gravity itself, which can be dangerous to humans. And that's a little bit less obvious. The lack of gravity can really mess up your hand-eye coordination, your balance, and also make you extremely motion sick. Also, because all the fluid in your body isn't sinking to the bottom due to gravity, it can move to your upper body, which can affect your eyes and your brain. However, we have about seven minutes to take a deep dive into a topic so that you can learn something. So let's talk about bones in space. We all know what bones are and the important roles that they play in support and protection, but how are they actually formed and why is this important? So very basically, how do your bones actually work? Well, they're not these solid structures that you might see on TV or on cartoons or even real life when you look at them. Roughly speaking, the big bones in your body are made up of two different types of bone. First, you have the cortical bone. That's the dense stuff on the outside, which you can see. And then you have the trabecular bone, trabecular bone, which is like the meshwork and has a bunch of holes in it on the inside. And the thing is, the bones are trying to balance two things. They want to be as strong as possible, and that would involve increasing the amount of bone, but they also want to be as light as possible, and that would be decreasing the amount of bone. Now, the bone does this by sensing the amount of stress that it's under and then adjusting the amount of holes in itself. Now, the cells that control these are the osteoblasts, B, blast for building, and osteoclast, C, for cutting away osteoblasts and osteoclasts and they essentially act in equilibrium to reach the happy medium between strength and lightness. So when the bone senses an increased pressure the osteoblastic activity is increased and the osteoclastic cutting activity is decreased. Now the issue comes when you remove that pressure but I don't know putting somebody in a zero-g environment well for like six months while you take them to Mars for example. <laughs> And this means there's absolutely no strain on the bones and therefore the builders take a break and the cutters start activating and your bones start getting very weak. So how bad is this problem? Well, put in perspective, an elderly woman on the ground could be losing bone mineral density, basically how strong her bones are, at a rate of 1% every year. 
and this obviously puts her at increased risk of breaking her bones or breaking a hip. A healthy astronaut in space could be losing their bone mineral density at 1% every month. The real concern, though, is what happens when you take those weak bones and suddenly expose them to gravity, both through the g-forces of landing, but also walking on the surface of the red planet. Now, having a pelvic fracture in this hostile environment, when the nearest bone surgeon is literally millions of miles away, is very bad news indeed. You could be bleeding out almost your entire blood volume into your pelvis, and your chances of survival with that hospital are pretty much nil. We're sorry. You have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service. Which is why these issues need to be conquered before we send humans out there safely. Luckily, this is where aerospace medicine comes in. And there have actually been some great breakthroughs which can hopefully turn the tide in our favour. So a study published in 2013 looked at a medication class called bisphosphonates, which in combination with exercise were shown to reduce the amount of bone loss which was occurring in astronauts. These medications are commonly given in medical practice to people with osteoporosis or fragile bones. And what they do is that they essentially turn off those osteoclasts. So the cutting of the bones reduces and the bones remain stronger for longer. Now, this is beneficial because if astronauts don't need to exercise as much, they can safely use more of their time for maintenance activities like research or just admiring the view. In addition, further studies have suggested that the use of a new exercise machine called the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device launched in 2008 and ensuring adequate nutrition has a significant impact on reducing bone loss. And the combination of these has led to the maintenance of bone density to almost pre-flight levels, which is really encouraging. However, we still don't know everything yet. There's only a small group of people, who are the astronauts that we've sent to space, that we can study. And because of this, it's difficult to know how these results will match up to people who aren't professional astronauts who are going to Mars. And this is why NASA has the Early Research into Osteoporosis Project to research this a little bit further. Remember also that your bones aren't the only thing that weaken in space. Your muscles weaken, your immune system, and your eyes all change too. And therefore, it is so important that we have as firm a grip as possible so we can take control of the underlying forces at play. And that's why aerospace medicine is going to be critically important as we advance our species deeper into space. We'd like to say a huge thank you to the Royal Aeronautical Society for this platform, AeroTube, and for letting us share our passion. Thank you so much for watching this video. We really hope it was interesting and that you gained something from it.